Hello everybody and welcome to our webinar today from Discovery to IND, a roadmap to a successful antibacterial project. I am Laura Piddock and I am the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnerships Scientific Director and I'm hosting today's session. Revive is, do apologise, Revive is a, our activity that we launched in 2018 and it's our online space where we seek to connect people and support the antimicrobial discovery research and development community. And we do this in a variety of ways. We facilitate learning, we connect people and we share knowledge. So we do this such as today with our webinars and all of our webinars are recorded and will be freely available after today. And you can see on this slide here, we're not only featuring today's webinar, but our next one. Please see the website address at the bottom here if you want to access any of our older webinar recordings. We also publish antimicrobial viewpoints. These are articles that are very short, but on very uh, current topics of interest, such as learning from infection prevention and control strategies from COVID-19 and how these can be applied in Nigeria to tackling antimicrobial resistance, or indeed looking at new antibiotics or looking at access and shortage of antibiotics Again, do take a look at these articles there at the website indicated below. We also have an antimicrobial encyclopedia, and this is where there's many terms that are frequently used within this area and that different people entering the area may not be familiar. So for instance, active pharmaceutical ingredient, API, many PhD students, for instance, would be unfamiliar with this but may need to know what it means. And you can click on this tab and find out the details about it. And some of these have videos from experts explaining them. So please take a look. So as always with webinars, you can submit your questions. You can do this during the presentations and afterwards in the question answer session. Please note that if you're going to submit a question, it'd be really helpful to us if you could indicate the name of the speaker to which you would like your question to be addressed. This panel will come up for the Q&A session and you can add your question in writing and it will be spoken by the moderator during the question answer session. So I'm now going to hand over to the moderator of today's session, Dr. Michael Mures. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Laura. Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to today's webinar by GuardP. We are very fortunate today as we are having two guest speakers, Dr. Patricia Bradford and Dr. Alita Miller. Together, our speakers will discuss the roadmap to a successful antibacterial project. Let me first introduce you to Dr. Alita Miller. Dr. Alita Miller is a Vice President and Head of Biology at Antasis Therapeutics. As you probably all know, Antasis Therapeutics was established in 2015 as a spin-out from AstraZeneca. As a biotech, Antasis, specialized in antibacterials, uh, is involved, the company is involved in several programs, such as the IV, BL, DLI combinations, Sulbactam, Dolobactam for Acinetobacter infections, as well as the novel antigonorrheal compound, Zoliflodacin, which is developed with the help of GARDP. Dr. Miller was trained at Kalamazoo College and University of Chicago in the United States, and she completed her postdoctoral training in the laboratory of Victor Dirita at the University of Michigan, working on Streptococcus pyogenes. Dr. Miller worked on antibacterial research in big pharmaceutical companies, such as Pfizer and AstraZeneca, prior to Antasis. She has contributed to numerous discovery projects in the field. And at Antasis, she oversees both the preclinical biology and the developmental microbiology research. And she's a member of the senior leadership team. 
One of our notable recent contributions pertains to the characterization of small molecule permeation and accumulation in bacterial pathogens. And I strongly advise you to turn to our wonderful publications on this topic. Let me now turn to Dr. Patricia Bradford. Dr. Bradford is an independent consultant and owner of Antimicrobial Development Specialists, a company dedicated to the development of antibiotics. Dr. Bradford was trained at the University of Nebraska Medical Center and Creighton University in the United States. And then she completed a postdoctoral fellowship in the laboratory of Karen Bush. As you probably are all aware, the laboratory of Dr. Bush is one of the most respected environments to work on beta-lactamase enzymes. Dr. Bradford went on to pursue a stellar career in antibacterial research in the pharmaceutical industry, working for big players like Novartis, Wyeth, and AstraZeneca. During her career, she contributed to the development and life cycle management of some of the most important antibiotic drugs we have today, such as piperacillin tazobactam, Tigacycline, and more recently, Ceftazidim avibactam. Amongst her credentials, Dr. Bradford is a fellow in the American Academy of Microbiology and a member of the Subcommittee on Antimicrobial Susceptibility Testing of the CLSI. Now that you are acquainted with our speakers, without further ado, Patricia will give you a short introduction of today's topic. Welcome, Patricia. You can start now. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, first, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers of this for inviting Dr. Miller and I to, um, to give this presentation. And we will be giving you um, an overview of what it takes to get a compound um, through a, an antibacterial development, discovery and development project. Um, these are our financial disclosures. So for this presentation, we are assuming that uh, a starting point, we are, you already have a starting point for your project, that you either have a compound or compounds from doing a screen or that you have a starting point with medicinal chemistry. And so now that you have these hits, um, what, what do you do with them to progress them? And so this is our agenda today that I'll be giving a short introduction and in introducing the concept of a uh, line of sight. And then I'll hand off to Dr. Miller, who will take you through um, hit to lead and lead optimization stages. And then I will return to talk to you about the late, later stage um, development with, with the intention of getting to first in human studies. So line of sight, what does this mean? It just means where are you going with your project? Do you know what your end goal is? And so, um, Two ways that you can look at your project. You can, um, you can throw a lot of spaghetti at the wall, meaning that you do many experiments and just see what works and make your decisions from that. Or you can um, be focused on a, a, a great goal like getting to the Emerald City by the Yellow Brick Road. And this is by doing focused experiments that, that generate decision-making data. Well, obviously, we all want to get to the Emerald City. And so um, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to help you um, stay focused and knowing where you're going. So for this line of sight, even at a very early stage of having just some hits from a screen, um, you, want to, um, you want to be able to, to know up front, where are you going with this project? And so some early decisions that you can make to help you know where you're going is what organisms are in scope for this compound? What diseases do these organisms cause? Is there an unmet medical need for those infections? And so with everything that you do and all of the things that we're going to be talking about throughout this presentation is that you, you have to know what your end goal is and where you're going. Now to get there, um, it is very helpful and you should be defining go, no go criteria at each stage of the project. And some um, some some uh, examples of go no go, go criteria for early stage things are, um, for example, what MIC do we need to achieve with medicinal chemistry efforts? Or uh, for later stage compound, what maximum tolerated dose would give you a reasonable therapeutic window? But for every stage, you should have go no go criteria. Now, we all know projects are never simple and that sometimes the roads 
the pathway can be very twisted and plans can change, but the end goal should remain the same. And so that still is your line of sight of, of knowing where you're going. So how long is the road from here to there? Meaning how long will it take you to get from um, a hit into first in humans? Well, the road is long, it is long there's a substantial amount of preclinical data that has to be generated before you can proceed into clinical trials. And the main things that you have to, um, main goals are to determine is the drug likely to be efficacious at the, in, with the infections for your end goal? Is the drug safe? And can you make the drug? Those are the things that we need to answer with the experiments that are done. And so with that, I'll hand off to Dr. Miller, who will take you through hit to lead and lead optimization efforts. Thanks, Dr. Bradford. And thank you to the organizers for giving us the opportunity to uh, talk about this important subject. Um, I wanted to start by giving you a higher level in, uh, summary of what I'd like to discuss today. And because it's such an extensive topic, we obviously can only cover the highlights here. So on this slide, I've given a list of related resources that I think that folks would really uh, benefit from if they're interested in learning more. There's been quite a bit of um, information available for early stage researchers for this topic, and they're listed here. And among those is a, a number of um, webinars as mentioned previously that's available at GARD-P. Um, another thing I'd like to just clarify for this, uh, this particular talk, um, antibacterials for this talk, we're talking only about direct acting compounds. Obviously there's virulence inhibitors and other interesting ways to approach antibacterial therapy, but because we have a time limit, we're only gonna focus on direct acting small molecule um, antibiotics today. All right, so um, what you do with your compound depends on how you discovered it. And I think most folks know that there's really two main ways of getting to that hit. You can either have an in vitro target-based screen, which is a biochemical assay usually, or you can have a phenotypic screen, which is either engineered um, to, is it either a, what's called empiric whole cell, or you basically, really don't know what your target is, you're just trying to kill the bacteria, or it can be a version of that where the whole cells have been engineered in such a way that there's a phenotype associated with inhibition of growth that would um, tell you something about how those compounds are acting. And the example I give here is sort of the uh, classical example from Merck um, back in 2007, which was a discovery of platin platinsin, which is a fab F inhibitor and Staph aureus. So um, the first thing to take into account when you're thinking about what to do with your hits is there's always going to be compounds that are promiscuous in these compound collections and you need to be ready to deal with those. The type of screening library is going to dictate what kind of hits you get, but in almost every screening library, uh, there are samples that are not what they're advertised. They're not at the same concentration as they're supposed to be. Some of them are not pure or even present. And uh, as I mentioned, there are promiscuous compounds as well. These are actually known as the panes, which is shown on the picture here uh, on the right-hand side. Pain stands for pan-assay interference compounds. And again, these are nonspecific hits that will give you a false positive. So the best way to avoid uh, following up on this um, wild goose chase really is to resynthesize the hits that you do get. And when you retest them, make sure you titrate uh, the resynthesized compounds to make sure it's an actual hit. And also, and especially, uh, be sure to collaborate with a medicinal chemist who is very familiar with these types of molecules and can advise you on um, which ones to prioritize as you proceed. So back to our screen, screening strategies, 
as I just mentioned, every single uh, approach needs to have a very thorough evaluation of the chemical attributes of their hits, regardless of how you got to that hit. But if we talk about um, antibacterial activity as the next hurdle, the phenotypic screens give you that advantage in that part of what the hit was, was that it could kill the bacteria in a certain way. For those, target, for those hits that are discovered from an in vitro target-based screen, uh, obtaining antibacterial activity is really the hardest part for this type of approach. If you have antibacterial activity, that's a great first step. But if you don't, and often you might not, you have to then go figure out why don't you have antibacterial activity? And there's plenty of reasons why this may not be true. It could be due to the potency of your molecule. It could be have something to do with the target copy number in, your, in the cells or escape pathways. There may be some mechanism of degradation you're not aware of in whole cells. But um, for uh, antibacterials and especially for gram negative compounds, the biggest hurdles are around permeation and efflux, which is why I've highlighted them in yellow. So how do you figure out how to get your in vitro uh, ad active compound to kill bacteria? There's a lot of challenges of engineering in this activity if you don't start there. And part of the problem is that antibacterial compounds are quite different than other drug classes. And there are numerous reviews on this topic. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to go into them. But you can see on the right-hand side, part of the problem is the gram-negative organisms have um, multiple barriers to compound entry. Beside the fact that they have two membranes instead of one, as I mentioned before, they have efflux pumps, selective porins, and they're just harder to get small molecules into the cell. On the left-hand side, I'm showing you, it's a classical example of the properties of antibacterials compared to other types of um, drugs. And this is from a review uh, written quite a long time ago now by David Payne um, discussing the problem. So um, some of the other references I think are worth looking at are listed here as well. Again, I don't have time to get into this, but it, it is one of the biggest challenges that we face in antibacterial discovery. And there has been some emerging science in recent years to try to engineer gram-negative activity. Again, we don't have time to uh, describe each of them, but there's a number of new approaches that can be used to try to uh, design in especially gram-negative activity. And they're listed here, and please feel free to follow up with any questions. And this is something that uh, the researchers at Entesis are particularly interested in um, pursuing. So let's now assume you have antibacterial activity from your compound. What do you do next? Um, for the target-based screen and for the engineered whole cell screen, you already kind of have an idea of what your target is because you've designed it that way. So it might be a little bit more straightforward to make sure that your antibacterial activity or MIC um, is actually due to the inhibition of the target. And that's how you tie it to the mechanism of action. For And part of doing that is a counter screen for selectivity and toxicity. And I'll talk about that in the next few slides. But for the um, empiric screen, where you don't know what your target is, you're kind of starting from scratch. You have no idea. And you have to um, try to use different methods to figure out how your compound is killing those cells. And after you've determined the mechanism of action, then you have to go on to uh, further experiments for um, all antibacterials, which I'll describe in a few slides. So let's talk about the toxicity screen. Part of HIT validation is, is showing that your HIT is actually specific and selective, and it's not just a promiscuous compound. You especially care about this because you want to be sure it's not toxic, to eukaryotic cells. And so the first uh, in vitro screens that you can do to confirm that it is a selective inhibitor is um, check for lytic activity. A common assay is just to look for red blood cell lysis. There's also uh, numerous different cytotoxicity tests in human cell lines that use a, a number of different readouts uh, as listed here, LDH or MTT, 
are um, some of them. The important thing here is you have to include positive and negative controls all the time. You have to incubate them for long enough, which is a, a common mistake that folks make. If they only incubate for eight hours and say it's not toxic, that's um, not really accurate. And another important thing is you have to take into account whether or not your compound has a protein binding uh, feature because the conditions that you use to test for cytotoxicity need to be similar to the conditions used for the MIC. Otherwise, you're not making sort of the apples to apples comparison. Uh, these types of tests, if uh, your group is not able to do them uh, itself can easily be outsourced. There's many um, CROs that can perform these. And this will give you the first uh, indication of uh, what we call therapeutic index or what the ratio of cytotoxicity or activity against eukaryotic cells to the activity to, against bacterial cells is. Now getting to the mechanism of action studies, um, there are sort of pathway level assays that you can do to hone in on what pathway your compound is acting upon. One of the examples I'm showing on the right-hand side here, it's called macromolecular synthesis assay. And it's a little bit old-fashioned because it uses uh, radio-labeled precursors to each of the main pathways of um, <clears throat> in the cell, such as um, RNA synthesis, DNA synthesis, translation, uh, cell wall synthesis. You treat your, your compounds, which have these labeled precursors with the compound of interest, and then you look for depletion of a specific precursor, and you can say, that's the pathway that my compound is inhibiting. There's more recent approaches that are a little more straightforward, um, like RNA-seq and TN-seq. Here you can um, treat with your compound and then sort of do a fingerprint analysis to see what inhibition with your compound, how does that match to inhibition with compounds that have uh, known mechanisms of action. Or for TNC, you can uh, select for mutants that might give you clues um, of the pathway of interest. Um, when you have a clue about the pathway, you really do need to show that their target inhibition is the cause of the bacterial killing. And this is uh, done with resistance mapping. Uh, where you raise spontaneous resistant mutants to your compound, and I'll describe that in a little more detail in the next slide. Once you have those mutants, you compare to the, the genome to the wild type parent and look to see where that mutation maps. If you're lucky, it will map to a, a, the target you think you're inhibiting. And then you have to confirm that it's actually the target by back crossing that mutant into a clean background to show a direct correlation. Another way to do this is to engineer a strain to either over or under express the target gene, and then you will should be able to see a change in MIC depending on how much of the target gene is available for your compound to inhibit, which is shown on the bottom right-hand side. All right, let's talk about resistance studies. The um, sort of the very fundamental uh, for antibacterial discovery is can you generate spontaneously resistant mutants to your compound? And this is usually done by um, making agar plates with increasing amounts of uh, your drug in the agar. You can see I've listed 2x, 4x, 8x MIC. Then you plate uh, a large amount of bacterial cells, usually a ten, 1 times 10 to the 9th of CFUs or more on each of these plates and you count to see how many colonies um, after 24 and 48 hour incubation arise. And that gives you a preliminary frequency of resistance. So if, say for example, on the 4X MIC plate, you have two colonies and you plated one times 10 to the ninth, your frequency of resistance is two times 10 to the minus nine. That's how many times you got a resistant mutant. However, you have to confirm that these um, colonies are stably resistant, and that means you take them from the plate you grow them up a couple times, then you put them back on drug place to see are they still resistant. And if that's the case, then you can go ahead with your sequencing to see where does the mutation map. So if you get uh, resistant mutants, that's great because it might tell you what your target is, but it's kind of bad because that means you got resistance uh, to your compound. So it's it's a, a sort of a balance uh, of being able to tell what your target is, but not getting such a high frequency of resistance that it's going to be a problem. 
If you don't get resistance, that's good because it means you have a very low frequency of resistance, but it's not so good because you still don't know what your target is. So um, another thing obviously is it's possible that you can get resistance that does not map to the actual target, but it maps to some resistance mechanism such as upregulated efflux um, or a downregulated porin, and then that doesn't really help you very much with respect to um, mapping your target. So if it gets to that, um, there are other things that you can do such as serial passage and other ways to generate mutants to try to get to your target. But this is sort of the basic first step for resistance studies. Um, everybody probably wonders what is an acceptable frequency of resistance. I would say rule of thumb, generally one times 10 to the eighth at 4x MIC or lower is what's considered acceptable. And I do think people must uh, understand they have to do frequency of resistance studies in multiple clinical isolates, not just a very susceptible lab strain. So you have a real world idea of resistance emergence. And um, it's also important to know that uh, the in vitro frequency of resistance doesn't always correlate to uh, what you might observe in vivo, but it's, uh, it's a, a practical first step. <clears throat> so once you have some of this preliminary data, you also have to characterize your compound to see how many and what kind of bacterial species are sensitive to those compounds. Obviously, you're looking to see whether or not this will correlate with what you're trying to develop, which we call target product profile. And the definition of a quote unquote good MIC also depends on other properties of the compound uh, related to how it um, is um, acts inside uh, animals or people. That's the PK properties, which I'll talk about a little later. Um, we also have to do susceptibility studies against multiple clinical isolates of the target pathogens, not just lab strains. Uh, unfortunately, low uh, MICs or potent activity against lab strains doesn't always guarantee that you'll see similar activity against clinical isolates. And the rule of thumb is uh, you really need to test 10 to 20 isolates in, in a hit to lead and up to 100 or more isolates, including multidrug resistant isolates in a lead optimization stage. You have to also um, characterize your compound for cross resistance to approved antibiotics. So some of the ways that we analyze those types of data for a large spectrum activity of studies, um, on the left-hand side, I'm showing you what is called a CUMPER plot that stands for cumulative percent inhibited. Um, the, the graph that I'm showing here is actually for zoloflavacin. Um, and, and what is shown is how many strains at each MIC are inhibited um, at that concentration of the drug. So the curves um, are cumulative percent inhibition, and you can see as olefladacin is the one at the very left-hand side, and we're comparing to some of the other antibiotics that are used for gonorrhea. MIC50 and MIC90 corresponds to the concentration at which the growth of 50 and percent and 90 percent of strains are inhibited, and that's a common metric that people use to compare compounds. On the right-hand side, you see this is an MIC distribution plot, and it shows how many of the isolates in your collection are susceptible at each MIC. So um, this I just took from the literature uh, for a variety of compounds against denatrophomonas multophilia, and you can see you know, what the, uh, the distribution looks like for each of those compounds that were tested. Again, there are uh, a number of CROs that routinely perform these larger studies, so it's not something that uh, necessarily each investigator has to do uh, on his or her own. At this point, you know, and I think I want to drive home what Patty said at the beginning was you really need to continually make data-driven decisions. Do your hits meet your advancement criteria? Are you being realistic about the, how your um, compounds are behaving? Are they attractive and tractable? Preferably, you will have more than one uh, series or scaffold to work on for your project. And whether or not they're tractable in lead optimization, meaning an analog, changing an analog will change the phenotypes that you're characterizing, is really the ultimate hit validation. 
And if there's a clear structure activity relationship in your analogs, that really does hold promise that it can be optimized. Ideally, your compounds should have low serum binding. They should be very low uh, in the cytotoxicity screens. Obviously, we would want low frequency of resistance and some evidence that your desired spectrum is achievable. And if you hit all those, then you really can feel confident you should move to lead optimization. So as you move from hit to lead to lead optimization, the key features that need to be characterized in this stage um, are those that you use to justify the fact that you should be able to put these into uh, people into an IND enabling uh, study. IND stands for an investigational new drug, and this is uh, where you start progressing towards the clinic. Your compound has to be drug-like. It has to have the right potency um, activity. We need to also, at this point, start looking at in vivo efficacy in preclinical models. Now, at this point, we start looking at drug metabolism and pharmacokinetics, which is called DMPK. and um, the metabolism part is also broken down into an acronym called ADME or absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. And obviously, again, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic properties, which I'll spend a few slides on, and more safety screening. So I'll talk a little bit about each of these. For the safety screens the and the ADME screens, um, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's sort of the uh, key parameters you need to consider for these studies. You have to perform solubility tests in various matrices. You have to characterize plasma binding for all uh, of the species you'll be investigating. The stability studies are done in microsomes in plasma and hepatocytes in vitro. There's also in vitro selectivity panels, and this is uh, really to screen against any particular homolog that might be um, a homolog in humans to your target, as well as transporters, channels, anything else that um, might be important for an off-target type of interaction. Um, one of the earlier assays that is done is called CACO2 permeability. This is a cell line that's an intestinal cell line and how your compound behaves in this assay will predict how permeable it is in the human intestine uh, with respect to efflux and uptake. Um, another one that is quite important is called SIP inhibition or induction. SIP stands for cytochrome P450, which is an enzyme that plays an important role in detoxification of chemicals and drug metabolism in humans and animals, and can um, uh, how your compound interacts with the SIP um, system will affect the efficacy because it might have effect on the half-life of your compound or toxicity if um, there are toxic metabolites. And one that I think everyone has heard of is called HERG inhibition, HERG is a subunit of a potassium ion channel that's involved in cardiac function, and um, it's really important to understand if your compound has any activity against this particular um, potassium channel. Um, moving on to preclinical models of infection, uh, they're almost always rodent. They're used to evaluate preclinical in vivo efficacy and PKPD. And um, there are various models. Obviously, you will want to prioritize those that are the most appropriate for your particular indication. Um, because they are models, they often require a high bacterial inoculum. Often the animals are immunocompromised and or adjuvants have to be used in order to establish the infection. And the most common are also acute um, Neutropenic rodent models, I've listed them here. Thigh and pneumonia are lung are the most common. Also skin and soft tissue, and there's a bacteremia that's pretty standard. There are also other types of infection models that are less common, such as urinary tract or meningitis or endocarditis. So there are quite a few um, preclinical models of bacterial infection. And there's also a lot of reviews out there on this topic. I've listed one here in the bottom right-hand corner. So let's talk now about PKPD. PK stands for pharmacokinetics, which is the study of the movement of the drug in the body. 
including how it's absorbed, distributed, localized, and transformed and excreted. Where PD is pharmacodynamics, that's um, how does the drug work um, in its target? What is the effect of the drug and what is the mechanism of action in the organism that it, that's being treated with it? So a PKPD is the study of how the drug moves in the body and what effect it exerts pharmacologically. This is a, what's called a PK profile. And you are basically plotting the uh, concentration of your drug as a function of time in a whatever um, matrix you want to see, say blood, plasma, or urine. The input here can be either dosed orally, or it's an IV infusion, or it can be given subcutaneous. And then the output that you measure is the distribution, metabolism, excretion, and efflux to GI ratio. So um, this is kind of where we, a starting point for the PKPD parameters. For antibiotics, um, the PKPD driver will determine uh, exposure effect relationships. So you really want to understand what pharmacodynamic property is what is most important for your antibiotic to exert its effect. And for different classes of antibiotics, these PKPD drivers are different. They can be driven either by concentration, called Cmax, shown here on the graph, or it can be time dependent, like how long is your antibiotic above a certain concentration, um, or it can be a mixture of both. So uh, as listed on the left, right hand side here, uh, things like beta lactams are a driven by how much time they are uh, above a certain MIC, whereas other types of um, antibiotics, aminoglycosides, are driven by a Cmax over MIC ratio. And then uh, fluoroquinolones and macrolides are the mixture of both. So this is important for when you're characterizing your new compound to understand what is the PKPD driver. And it's logical also to uh, understand that how often you dose and how long your compound stays in circulation will dictate what the PKPD um, exposure is. So on the right, left-hand side, you can see what happens to a drug when it's dosed once a day or Q24 hours. And on the right-hand side, you can see that same drug, if it's administered three times a day, that gives you different PKPD exposures. Uh, I'm going to wrap up my section just telling you briefly about um, many in vitro systems that are used before you advance to um, models of infection. One of them is called in vitro hollow fiber. It's a very convenient way to uh, determine your PKPD drivers before you move to animal studies. And this is a, a picture. It's basically there's a hollow fiber cartridge that has a lot of... Um, um, fibers in it to sort of simulate a mouse and the, and it's set up with a series of pumps to control how much drug goes in and at what rate it gets turned over. And so it's a nice uh, in vitro system that you can use before you advance to the animal models. And another one that uh, is also commonly used is called the chemostat model, which is similar to hollow fiber, except instead of the uh, fibrous chamber, you just have a vessel called the chemostat, and you um, can only control the media in and out, which is just a simpler system than the hollow fiber. But both of these are very important tools that are helpful for investigators to understand PKPD before they move to efficacy studies. So um, I wanna end my section of the talk by just pointing out that advancing a preclinical candidate uh, is it can be very complex. Many properties must be taken into account. Even though the target potency and antibacterial activities are important, uh, equally important is the ease of synthesis, resistance potential, the safety, physical, chemical, ADME, and PK properties, as I mentioned before. And sometimes the choice is not obvious. So it's, uh, it's not going to be necessarily very straightforward, but hopefully if you have multiple series, you'll be able to advance to the point where you are ready to 
move from lead optimization to the next stage. So I will hand it over at this point to Patricia. Thank you, Alita, for that very thorough overview. Um, so, um, so she's taking you through uh, pre -can pre clinical candidate selection, and as she said, it's um, sometimes it's very clear to have one compound. Sometimes it's not so clear, and you may have um, you know up to three compounds that you want to take uh, through the next steps, which involve safety for the clinical candidate. So, um, so what we're aiming for, our line of sight now, is what is taking us to, um, to the, getting into clinical trials, getting into the for phase one uh, first in human studies. And so to do that, we have to organize um, our data into an IND, Investigational New Drug Application. Um, and the objective of the IND is to show that the compound has a reasonable chance to work against the target infections and that it's safe at the projected human doses. So that's the objective. Now, when we're talking about preclinical microbiology and um, animal data, there's no checklist of requirements um, at this stage. But um, what I like to think about is um, kind of the red face test is if I were standing up in front of the regulators or a physician that I'm asking to um, to join a clinical trial, do I have enough data to, to show that we really think that this, uh, this drug has a reasonable chance to work and that it's safe? And so um, there's a lot of things that can be included. As I said, none of this is required, but um, you want to have a sufficient data package to convince someone that this will work. So basically, in in vitro uh, microbiology, Alita's already talked about um, how to do these things, but a standard package should include the mechanism of action. Um, you should include activity against re relevant clinical isolates. Now, this um, should be 50 to 100 isolates per organism of of what you want to cover. So if you're having, um, you know, something for all Enterobacteria, you need to have that many strains for each of those organisms frequency of resistance and sometime kill curves for static or cytal determination. And then um, the standard model, models for PKPD, which she's already explained, are thigh, usually the thigh, including dose fractionation, which I'll um, talk about a little later. And then you do have to, to demonstrate that the drug will work at the proposed site of infection. So if your, um, if your aim is to have a urinary tract infection, uh, something for your infections, you should have a model um, that covers UTI. So um, of, of all those things that, that you want to be putting into your IND, I'm going to just highlight a few of them of bringing up things that maybe you hadn't thought about of, of what should be included. And the first of these is um, determining the antimicrobial susceptibility testing conditions. Um, this sounds obvious, but sometimes it's it's not obvious. And so why do you need to, um, to worry about how the MIC is tested? Well, knowing the correct MIC for an organism is, is essential for all facets of clinical development. If you think about it, the MIC is, um, is really the cornerstone for all your PKPD work, which then translates into your dose selection and it also impacts the safety, the safety studies because the doses that you'll choose for safety studies. So it's really imperative that you are very confident that your MIC is correct. And so um, when you have a new drug, you shouldn't assume that the basic testing method in Mueller-Hinton, as suggested by CLSI and UCAST, is really the best method for your drug. You should um, you know, look for things, um, so, so it, very well could be the best, but it but don't assume that it will be. And so throughout your development program, you should be looking for things that don't make sense. Look for discordant results. For example, the drug might work better in vivo than the MIC suggests, or you see discrepancies between organisms. For example, um, a low MIC for Staph aureus and a high MIC for strep pneumonia, which is tested in a blood matrix. And that just wouldn't make sense from a science a, a, a biology standpoint. So you would want to figure that out. A few examples of alterations in te test methodology 
include cation adjustment for daptomycin, the use of fresh media for tigacycline, the use of the wetting agent polysorbate 80 for televancin, aridavancin, dalbavancin, and most recently, the use of iron depleted media for cifidorocol. Now, for each of these development programs, there was one of these discrepancies noted um, somewhere along the line, and so investigations were done to sort out what then is the best method for um, getting your MICs. Now, this is not about getting your, the lowest MICs, but what actually is the right answer that correlates with your in vivo data. Additionally, if you're developing a beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor combination, that does require a justification for the amount of inhibitor used. You can't just assume that you're gonna use the same concentration that's used by previous inhibitors. You have to have a justification of why this concentration or ratio is the best for your drug. And then um, finally, there is a working group at CLSI called the Methods Working Group. And that's a good resource for feedback on alternative methods. So if you have a, a new drug and you wanna propose a different way of testing, um, I would encourage you to go talk to this working group and they will give you some good feedback on whether that's viable or not viable. Um, the second thing is talking about a breakpoint. And um, you will hear this term a lot in clinical development, um, but also for use in the clinical lab. Uh, and I'll talk to you now about why it's important for some earlier stages than maybe you think. So a breakpoint is, um, it's really a susceptibility test interpretive criteria. So we're trying to say um, that uh, drawing a line of where, of MICs that below this line, they're susceptible, above that, above the line are resistant. And so um, the breakpoint is really a classification of where you draw that line. And it's meant to predict that uh, if the, if the breakpoint uh, shows that the MIC is in the susceptible category, that, that um, there's, a, there's a reasonable expectation that that, um, that drug could be used to, to, um, to treat a patient and would respond at clinically relevant um, do dose regimens. And so for a breakpoint, the most important reason that you have it is for, um, to detect resistance, that if it has known resistance mechanisms, you don't want to use the drug for that, and it should, should clearly define the resistant population. And then the second reason is that you want to establish MICs that are covered by PK exposure as we go forward. So, um, so a breakpoint may not be exactly where um, the resistant population occurs, but it could be the, the upper limit of where your PK covers. Um, a little bit later, when the drug is actually available to patients, the information of a breakpoint is provided to a physician as susceptible, intermediate, or resistant. Um, but here's the important point for you, is that a preliminary breakpoint should be developed in, uh, in your thinking for your drug development, and this will be based on PKPD. And this is going to be important for, um, for every stage going forward into clinical development, um, because it does relate to PKPD, it relates to your dose selection, um, and what, then again, what organisms could be covered by by that PKPD, it may it may mean that your drug covers E. coli, but maybe not Klebsiella. Um, with the, with that, so uh, so breakpoint, thinking about the breakpoint and what is possible to cover for your drug is important um, as soon as you have a clinical development candidate. Um, Dr. Miller talked about the dose fractionation. She ta she talked about um, the PK drivers of efficacy. And I'll just spend a minute to explain how this is determined. Um, and that's done by dose fractionation. And this can be done with either the hollow fiber experiments or it can be done in mice. Um, it should be done in mice. Eventually you can do hollow fiber as a preliminary, um, a preliminary look. And why do we need to know the PK driver of efficacy? Well, it has to do with determining the dosing. So if you have a drug that's free time above MIC, you should see better efficacy with more frequent dosing that keeps the drug level above an MIC for a longer period of time. If you have a drug that's um, AUC over MIC driven, it, the frequency of dosing doesn't really matter. It's the, just the total da daily dose of the drug. 
And then if you have a drug that is CMAX driven, the efficacy is better with one single higher dose. And to do this experiment, then you give identical daily doses that are given um, as either a single dose or equivalent um, total daily dose as intermittent doses. And so that would be a full dose given once, um, half a dose given uh, 12 hours apart, third of a dose given um, eight hours apart, or a quarter of a dose given, and this is a typo, it should be six hours. So four doses given six hours apart. And then um, you would model that to the bacterial response uh, for the drug exposure. Um, and in this example, it's showing that time above MIC gives the best correlation between a change in uh, colony counts in the thigh versus the drug level uh, compared to the CMAX here and the AUC, which have very little correlation. Now, it is important to test multiple strains when you're doing these dose fractionation studies. In this example, we're showing that there's two strains of Pseudomonas aeruginosa that have been tested um, for a time above MIC drug, and um, the, but they, they do differ slightly, and the, the, um, the, the efficacy driver value of time, time above MIC for stasis is quite different for these two strains, and so um, it is important to test multiple clinical isolates so that you get a good range and a good mean for what that driver is and what the magnitude is. Um, so these then lead us to dose selection for the first in human studies that um, it does require a very strong PKPD package, which should include in vitro microbiology, as we've already discussed, um, MIC frequency of distribution for target pathogens, time kill studies, um, perhaps a, a hollow fiber model, um, but definitely the animal models of infection for to confirm the, the PK driver, and that would be the, the dose fractionation. And then it does require um, good modeling then to determine the thresholds required to achieve efficacy. And from that, you would do allometric scaling to determine the projected human dose. Um, and then again, backtracking what MIC is covered by this threshold, and that goes back to what is your um, what what is your drug covering? What is the breakpoint that of of MICs that can be covered by that PK? Um, I'm just providing this as some useful resources for preclinical pharmacology, FDA microbiology guidance. Um, basically, this is a checklist for submission, but there's a lot of good information about um, uh, how studies should be done. The CLSI document M23, it's not only about developing susceptibility tests, but there's some really good information about uh, how to do PKPD studies. And then the EMA antibacterial guidance is an overall development guide for antibacterial, um, develop, antibacterial products. So moving on to safety, this is a very important uh, part, obviously, of, of progressing your drug into, um, into human studies. And there's two levels of safety studies that are done in animals. Um, the first are dose ranging studies. This is, um, the dose ranging studies are, it's not required to be done by GLP, the, the, which is good laboratory practice. Um, often you just need mice or rats, uh, one species, either, you know, one rodent species, mice or rats. Um, and there's two, two stages to this. The first is acute single dose. It's a dose es escalation to establish a maximum tolerated dose. Um, and this one is you're looking for outward signs and symptoms of um, adverse events in the, in the ro rodent. The second stage is multiple day dosing, which is typically five to 14 days of dosing, uh, repeated dosing. Um, it isn't required, but we strongly encourage that you would do histopathology at this stage. Um, they, um, many, drug, many antibiotic projects uh, fall out at this stage, in the safety stage. And it's much better to know early if you have an issue with some, um, with some safety signal that you can't necessarily see by signs and by clinical signs and symptoms in the mouse. And so um, histopathology on target organs, heart, liver, um, kidney is, is strongly encouraged. Now this is required for um, to move on to first in human studies, these are called the IND enabling studies. 
These must be done under GLP um, study uh, conditions, which is uh, probably beyond most um, small uh, biotechs or academics. Um, but there are many GL there are many um, CRO labs that can perform um, GLP studies for you. So that's where you would go to get them done. Um, the, G the, the IND enabling studies often use three doses, um, which are chosen to achieve multiples of an AUC at a projected clinical dose. Um, the low dose is subtherapeutic. The, mi the middle dose is um, around what your estimated therapeutic dose would be, and hopefully you can achieve a high dose that's at or near an MTD. And the target for this MTD uh, is 50 times the therapeutic dose. You can't always achieve that, but that's the, um, the target that FDA likes to see. It is required to have one rodent and one non-rodent species. For IND enabling studies, it's usually rats and dogs. Um, these studies are typically two weeks to start the su support of clinical trials, two weeks of dosing. And then um, following up that, you need a four-week study, and that, um, that four-week study can be done while the clinical trials are, are ongoing. Um, it's important to note that the drug substance and formulation for your IND enabling studies should be the same as what will be used for your phase one study. So you do need to have the clinical dose ready to go, and that's what's used in the IND enabling studies. Um, these studies will also include tarsicokinetics, which, which will max, match up PK observations with any, um, with any toxic, toxic uh, uh, effects that are seen. And the endpoint for these uh, IND enabling studies are um, the no AEL, which is no observed effect level, um, and, I, and an ideal no AEL would provide a five to 10 X therapeutic window from your projected dose. Um, something that you may or may not have thought about is the chemistry manufacturing of the drug substance. As I mentioned, um, it has to be the same batch for the GLP studies, uh, IND enabling and the phase one. This batch has to be produced using um, GMP conditions, good manufacturing practices. practices. And all impurities should be characterized. It's very important to so that if there's any um, if there's any adverse events either in the um, safety studies or in a phase one that those can be traced back to either from the drug or from from some impurity. The bulk substance and manufacturing product packaging um, is involved at this time. Um, you may or may not realize that a, a uh, if, you have, if you're working on a beta-lactam, that does require a separate and dedicated uh, facility for making the beta-lactams. It has to be completely separate. No other drugs can be made in that building. And that's because of the um, potential for allergic reactions. At this stage, also, you need to um, think about excipients that are added to your drug, either for solubility or stability problems, and to define any dosing incompatibilities. There should be uh, sterility and quality control measures. And also a, a number of st stability studies should be done. And this is not only for um, the, um, the bulk drug as in storage, but it should also be upon, for, for example, for an IV drug, once you reconstitute it, how long is it stable before it needs to be injected into the patient? And then finally, um, just a little bit about the regulatory pathway for this. Um, for, for your, um, for your IND um, filing, that um, at this stage, uh, it is not required to meet with the regulatory agencies, um, but it is encouraged for both uh, FDA and EMA. Uh, they can give great advice. So um, it is, so we would encourage you to meet with them um, early and often and take their advice uh, on, you know, things that, that you may have not thought of, of what your you know, of, of things that you may need to do for your drug. Um, before the first in human studies are conducted, you do have to file an application. This is called an IND uh, investigational new drug, drug application that goes for the US and the FDA. 
in Europe, it's called a CTA, clinical trial application, um, but it's basically the same document. They follow the common te technical document format. And um, so uh, basically, it's like I said, basically it's the same doc document. Now the initial IND would be filed in the country where you wanna do your first in human studies, but then after that, you would have to file them with each of the regular, which is each of the major regulatory agencies. So that is a lot to cover. Um, in conclude, our concluding statement is there's a lot to do, <laughs> a lot to do. Um, and so this is our best advice to you. This comes from uh, Dr. Miller and myself of um, tips for staying on the straight path to having a successful project. So um, at every stage that you're doing, um, think about that line of sight. Is there a practical use for this at the end of the day? Given the spectrum of activity, what are the potential indications for this drug and what's the unmet medical need? Um, second piece of advice, don't generate data that you don't need. We don't wanna be those people throwing spaghetti at the wall that for each experiment, you should ask, what's the purpose of this? Why am I doing it? And how am I gonna use this data? Whether it's um, to check a box of something that's required, or is it something that we're going to be um, making a decision on? Uh, we, you shouldn't be generating data just for data's sake, and more data isn't necessarily better, but it should be purposeful data uh, and, and something that you, um, you know why you're doing the, the experiment. Don't be afraid to generate data that might give you a, ne a negative result. Um, a lot of times people will think that, um, uh, oh, we, we may um, do, do an experiment that, that's going to um, not be good for the project. Well, um, having, ending a project based on science isn't failure, not at all. Good leaders know when to, to end a project. And that's why we do experiments. They're called experiments for a reason. So you shouldn't be afraid to generate the data that might give you a negative result. And finally, the flip side of that is you should absolutely plan for success. Um, I highly encourage you to write study reports as you go. The data is generated while it's fresh in your mind um, ha and having those ready. Um, we also encourage you to develop slide decks that explain your rationale for proceeding at each step. These will, um, serve several purposes. They will help you to develop your thinking about the line of sight and what you've done to get there, but they'll also be at the ready in case your management or investors or regulatory agencies um, ask questions about what you're up to. And with that, we will end um, the presentation and we will go into our Q&A session. Thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you, Alita. Uh, we will now start the Q&A session. Um, as a quick reminder for the audience, you can submit your questions as shown on this slide. Please include the name of the speaker uh, you are addressing your question to, and we will do our best to respond to as many questions as possible during the, the time that we have left. So to start, a uh, question for Dr. Miller. Um, uh, this is regarding the, um, the, uh, the preclinical toxic uh, toxicity counter screens that you uh, that you talked about. Uh, given the fact that there are so many uh, candidates that fail uh, once they they progress, uh, would you advocate for a change in the in the current panel of preclinical toxicology uh, counter screens that uh, that are being conducted, and which one? Um. So I, would, I think that the current screens that are in place are probably the right ones. I, I don't know that a different toxicity screen would be give you more information. I just think you have to be sure to uh, design the tests the right way and make sure that you include all the controls and you know are realistic with the interpreting of the results. So I'm not sure that... Um, that it's really the toxicity test that's the problem. I think it's just because antibiotics, because they're dosed at such high levels, you know, really have to worry about toxicity much more than other uh, types of drugs. So, right. Maybe you related to that question. There is a question about um, uh, the relevance of performing um, a, a maximum tolerability study. So to go uh, to get a single high, very high dose in rodents. 
and whether you should do that early on and how uh, good the correlation between this high uh, um, dose in uh, in rodent uh, would tra translate to into humans tolerability. Dr. Bradford, would you like that? Take that one. Sure, I'll take that one. Um, so it is related to the last one, and you should look at these safety studies as um, maybe a series of hurdles to get through. That all of all of the things that we've discussed have their purpose, and each one needs to be taken sequentially. So relating back to the in vitro screens, um, those are meant to weed out compounds that are very going to be very obviously toxic. Um, then the next stage would be the maximum tolerated dose where you give um, you you give uh, you know doses up up until they're they're lethal basically. Um, and so again, it's a it's a hurdle to get through. It's a very crude assessment of in vivo safety. So there's many layers beyond that. Um, so you should view the maximum tolerated dose for what it is. It's um, you know an extreme upper limit of of where the safety would occur. But then there's going to be many layers beyond that once you start getting into the, the regular safety studies in vivo. Thank you. Uh, another question for Dr. Miller on the same topic. What is an acceptable therapeutic index for the CC50 over MIC at the HIT validation stage? What would you recommend? Yeah, that's a great question because uh, you certainly don't want to um, terminate something too early if you see some signal, but you also have to be realistic about being able to advance something. So I would say rule of thumb for us. We obviously, the, the bigger the uh, difference, the better. But I would say at least, you know, 50-fold in an in vitro assay would be where I would maybe target uh, to start. But again, if you, depending on your series, if there are clear ways of uh, mitigating that toxicity, then I wouldn't necessarily stop, but I would definitely prioritize trying to mitigate that earlier rather than later. Thank you. So now I have a few questions on the animal models of uh, efficacy, and those questions are for Dr. Bradford. Um, so one question is about um, uh, what are your thoughts about uh, moving in vivo, these in vivo POC, of, uh, POC studies uh, as early as possible in the preclinical process to determine if a compound series is viable prior to the more detailed uh, tests? Yeah. Great question. Um, yes, earlier is better. <laughs> it's always it's always better to do to do these as, as early as possible. Um, in the section where I was talking about, it could be the same animal models that um, Dr. Miller was talking about in her section. So those models could have been done two years prior to your your IND um, package, but you you have to have you have to have those models in place so yes absolutely early the earlier that you can get them done the better still on the in vivo model topic um a question about uh, what if you for whatever reason you have to uh, to use uh, not very well validated models so something outside the the thigh the lung models um should you include the the normal models uh, the the thigh and the lung models uh or could you go to the and all the way to the and with just these not well validated uh, model. Yeah, yeah. Um, you you do you do have to have both. So for um, to do the PKPD studies, you have to do the, the standard models that would be expected. So the the minimum would be the thigh model. Um, if you're um, planning to have a pneumonia indication, then you must have the lung. If you have some other um, models that haven't been uh, validated or or um, aren't typical, um, yes, include them. They're, they could be quite interesting to the agencies. You would have to just have to provide more information about how it was done and why why you did it that way. Thanks. A question to, uh, to Dr. Miller about uh, the, the hard choice of moving past the, the heat characterization and into the lead optimization. So as you said, there are, it's not an easy an easy answer. Do you know uh, or do you have a general idea of what are the characteristics that where you are confident that optimization is possible and conversely, uh, wh what are the uh, the characteristics where it's probably a no-go even at this early stage? Yep, um, thank you for the question. I do think that 
this is the point at which um, your chemistry will really dictate the potential for moving forward. Again, if you have a series that you have very good SAR, that means when you make analogs and you uh, make them in a certain way because you think it's going to make the activity worse or better, and um, your predictions turn out to be true, and there's more than one way to optimize your compound, I feel like that is uh, the type of series you want to be working on so that you know that you will have more options as you go down to lead optimization. And, we, and I've been involved with projects in the past where it seems like a very promising hit, but you really don't have very many ways to make analogs. And um, you try the first five and none of them really move the needle in any way, then it's really not very promising. It doesn't look like you're gonna have a path forward. So even, even if you have you know preliminary in vivo efficacy with just one molecule, if there's no um, other alternatives that you can do to address some of the issues you're facing, I think it's, it's just not something you're gonna to wanna to spend a lot of time on. Thank you. Uh, still a question for, for you, Dr. Miller, um, regarding the resistance uh, studies. So one question is about the fact that you mentioned the tests are lasting only 24 to 48 hours. Uh, aren't these lengths too short uh, for a realistic idea about the potential for the compound to generate resistant, resistance? Wouldn't longer studies um, be more realistic and how to perform them? Yes, that's a great question too. Um, there are a lot of different ways to perform resistance studies. Obviously, the longer you go uh, and don't see resistance, the better. But I think that you have to also be realistic in terms of um, resistance emergence um, and how that relates to the actual um, PKPD and the exposure of the drug during a, um, during a clinical regimen, for example. Um, it's kind of surprising that some of the marketed agents that we have uh, have fairly high frequencies of resistance. People don't realize that, and they're very effective drugs. The carbapenems, for example, are surprisingly uh, have high frequency. So even if you have, you know, resistance emergence, I don't think that um, it's something that should stop you altogether in progressing a compound. You just have to be aware of it. But if you do want to go on to um, further characterize resistance, the hollow fiber model is actually a great way to um, tie resistance emergence to the uh, dosing regimen and concentration of your drug. And that way you have a better feel for, you know, sort of what clinical setting might give you with respect to resistance emergence. And also serial passaging experiments. So the serial passaging experiments can be taken out for quite a long time. Yes, and obviously that if you don't get resistance, that's fantastic. But if you do, you know, it's not necessarily a showstopper. Thanks. Uh, question for Dr. Bradford. If you target a shorter treatment than two weeks, uh, um, would the FDA accept shorter studies than two weeks to support uh, the first in human? Um, is it possible then to perform some bridging studies to be accepted by the EMA? Or would the GLP tox package need to be repeated on two weeks? Yeah, that, that would be, um, that's, a, that's a great question too. Um, what I said about the two weeks and the four weeks, that is what is listed in the FDA's guidance document for safety studies about what is required. So that is the current requirement. If you have, um, you know, say a, 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 a drug that might be one dose only and you're done, that would be a conversation that you'd want to have with the agency. And that would be a very good reason of why you would want to meet with them early on in your development program and have that, that conversation. They may allow it. I just don't know. I'm just, I'm just giving you the information about what's in their current guidance document. But, but you talk to them. Uh, regarding uh, the, the meeting with the FDA, actually, there is a question for you, Dr. Bradford, too. How early do you organize a meeting with the FDA or the EMA? And can you organize the meeting after lead selection, for example? And the, uh, uh, the person is asking the question to see if there is a need to tailor the candidate selection studies to the FDA or EMA suggestions. Yeah. Um, I would say um, the earliest that you'd want to talk to them is when you have a clinical ca candidate. So you have either one or two compounds that you you have um, that you're re re ready to aim towards human studies. Um, now, the um, European Agency has a scientific advice working party. 
um, group that they, it's a completely science. It has nothing to do with the regulatory aspects per se. Um, but those, that's a group that you can talk to earlier than I would say FDA. Um, but FDA, you could start interacting that with them when you have a clinical candidate selected. Your question for Dr. Miller regarding the uh, the resistance studies. Uh, so you you said that uh, there was no correlation all the time between the in vitro frequency of resistance and in vivo frequency of resi or in, vi in vivo resistance. Uh, what kind of studies would you suggest to assess the potential for in vivo resistance appearance? Yeah, that's a great question. I think this is one of the biggest challenges for the field. I didn't mean to say there's never a correlation. I think there's often a correlation, but sometimes there is not. And so you just have to be ready for that eventuality. But I I um, do think that if you do see in re high frequencies of resistance in vitro, you need to take them seriously. There are definitely examples of where people felt that um, the resistance emergence of observed preclinically would not be an issue clinically, and that turned out not to be the case. Um, there have been a lot of dis well, some discussion about you know whether or not in vivo frequency of resistance studies are worth it. Uh, you, you clearly would want to track to see if the anything you recover from an efficacy studies where you should have um, covered those uh, MICs to see whether there's resistance emergence there. But I don't. I'm not familiar with any sort of standard um, method to to predict in vivo frequency of resistance emergence. Dr. Bradford, do you have any comments on this one? No, the, in, the demonstration of um, resistance developing in in vivo models is very difficult. And even drugs where we know it happens um, in the animal models, it's very difficult to, to, um, to demonstrate it because the PK is so different in, in the, the animals. And so, um, yeah, it's a very complex, I think, um, you, you know, using the hollow fiber is is one way that you can do it a little better to predict what happens in a human being, but um, it's it's not always uh, a direct correlation, like like Dr. Miller said. So regarding uh, regarding the hollow fiber, actually, so it's a question for maybe both of you. Um, it's uh, uh, is there a discrepancy? Can can you sometimes see a discrepancy between the PKPD uh, drivers that you see in the whole of fiber and the animal models? And also in the animal models, do you do the PKPD study in only one type of infection, or do you have to do it in different types of infections? Mm -hmm. So the second part of that question, um, the the dose fractionation study is done with the thigh model typically. Um, I have I have seen people do it with the lung infection model, but the standard um, the standard model and what is most accepted is the thigh model for for that. Now, um, is there sometimes a discrepancy between the hollow fiber um, and the animals? Um, I don't recall seeing that, but I have seen discrepancies between different organisms that um, it might be. Uh, you know, one type of organism looks like it might be time above, one type of organism looks like it might be AUC. And so I think the thinking is evolving that sometimes it's a complex picture and both there, there might be two different um, or, or, you know, both efficacy drivers have to be taken into account. Yeah, I think it's also worth pointing out the hollow fiber model sort of, you know, because there's no immune system uh, associated with it. It's it can represent sort of your worst case scenario where if you know the organism that you're dosing has no immune system. So it's possible that when you do uh, efficacy or even you know human studies, that component just isn't represented in the hollow fiber. And so you'll get some differences there as well. A question for you, Dr. Miller. Uh, given the similarity between the bacterial and the mitochondrial genomes, do you incorporate uh, specifically some micro mitochondrial toxicity screening? And if so, which tests would you recommend? Yes, that's for sure important, uh, especially for certain classes of drugs that uh, inhibit, that are protein synthesis inhibitors, the uh, oxazolinones, for example. Uh, there's a, there are both in vitro and um, cell-based assays for those types of tests. And I, and I guess it would sort of depend on the um, target of inhibition and whether or not 
say, for example, it's a protein synthesis inhibitor, that's something you definitely want to prioritize. But if it's something that is not related, this is safe for cell wall, it would be less of a priority. Um, but yes, I think that those are important to take into account for sure. A quick one on the same topic. Uh, the, uh, you did not mention screening for mutagenicity. Uh, mutagenicity as part of the early screening profile. Is there a reason why not? No, no, that, that's definitely in there. The AIMS test is an important one. I, um, I I listed sort of the highlights, but I didn't want people to think that was a comprehensive list. So I apologize if I, I missed that. But yes, mutagenicity is another important test. The, the only caveat to that is that for um, antibacterials, the AIMS test is difficult because if you have activity against gram negatives, you're going to kill the cell strain that uses that the salmonella strain that's used for the AIMS test. So um, the AIMS test is one of the things you have to do it, but it may or may not be informative of, for an antibacterial project. Is he frozen? He might be frozen. <laughs> Connection issues. Okay. Um, so, question for Dr. Bradford. I think it's uh, it's a very generic question. At what stage in the drug development can one apply to QIDP status, and what good does it do? <laughs> um, I would. Uh, I don't know. I I don't know the answer about when. I would say. It would be reasonable to do it at your candidate selection state. Um, what good does it do? I think the jury is still out on that, that we haven't had enough drugs go through the process to know what the long-term effects um, will do. Alita, do you have any other insights into that? Yeah, I agree. I, I, I know it feels like a box check, but it might actually make a difference at some point. It's not worth, I mean, it's worth trying anyway. There's no downside except it takes time. <laughs> yes, uh, thanks. A uh, question about the, again, the preclinical models of infection. In those models, the test compounds are often administered right after the infection or at the time of the infection. Uh, what is the thinking on this? And should treatment arms be significantly delayed to better mimic what's happening in the human condition? So maybe a question to, I don't know, you, Dr. Mira? Right. Or, do you want to say? Okay, you can. Okay. Um, so, it, yeah, great question. Um, yes, it does not mimic the um, the human condition. The problem with it is that in mice, often um, often the infections are rapidly um, uh, so sorry, I'm having a brain freeze. They're they're um, they're very rapidly progressed to mortality. And so, um, you know, if you if you give the infection time to set up, like we would think about an established um, infection, pneumonia, say, to take the lung infection. So if you if you allow the, the, the infection to set up, um, the mice will be dead as soon as the, the infection is set up. So for practical reasons, you you um, it's done where you have to dose very shortly after because um, the mice just don't survive the infection otherwise. Understood. A question for, for you, Dr. Miller. What is the current status of target based uh, phenotypic screening? And uh, how do you see the, the future direction of HIT finding? Oh, yes. So, um, unfortunately, you know, the field has shrunk quite a bit in the last few years. Not very many groups, at least uh, in biotech, are doing our early stage. I, th I would hope that still there are academics out there trying to find new antibiotics. Um, I mean, the types of, each type of screen has its own benefits, but I, uh, you know, the phenotypic screens, for me, at least give you the advantage in that you know you have a uh, whole cell activity. So the current state is, um, honestly, I'm not quite sure who, you know, if any any more advanced uh, phenotypic screens have been developed successfully, I would hope so. I know that there are lots of, well, 
so I've seen some very good ideas, but I don't know um, whether or not they've progressed to any particular state. So um, I certainly hope that people will continue to be creative and come up with new approaches. And again, I mentioned we're not we're talking about direct acting small molecules here, but I there are plenty of people thinking of other ways to develop new antibacterials. So you know, we encourage that type of creative thinking as well. So a question for, for both of you, maybe starting with you, Dr. Bradford, it's, uh, it's kind of a personal question. So could you give an example uh, when you had to end a project and what was the reason for, for, for yeah. doing, putting this decision? <laughs> yeah, well, um, you know, both Dr. Miller and I have worked in antibacterial research for a long time. And so we have many examples of um, of uh, ending projects. And um, I'll just give you one that was very near and dear to my heart, and it still makes me sad, um, <laughs> that we had a, uh, um, a, a natural product that was um, then modified to give really exquisite activity against gram-positive infections. And um, it was at the very last stage of, um, you know, our GLP studies, our IND enabling um, studies and it was uh, found that the the compound gave um, injection site necrosis um, uh, at the uh, you know at the IV site and uh, you know going back and doing a lot of PK modeling it was just felt that we um, couldn't dose it in a sufficient way to make it safe and we had to end the project and that was very sad. Alita, do you have an example? <laughs> well, we have plenty of them. I guess. You know, one thing I think people have been trying very hard and for years is LPXC is a really attractive target. So many people have tried to find LPXC inhibitors, but they haven't been able to overcome the toxicity. And uh, even one got to clinical phase one and uh, immediately ended the occasion compound. So, you know, that's really, it feels like uh, a bit of the Holy Grail or Emerald City. If somebody could break through there, that would be very exciting because all of us have tried and failed for that target. So. Indeed. Well, thank you. We have uh, now come to an end of our Q&A session. I would like to thank everybody for their questions and comments. Sorry we could not take all of the questions. Uh, once more, thanks uh, to you, our speakers, and I'm now handing over to you, Laura. Thank you, Michael. And thank you also, uh, Patricia and Alita, for your excellent presentations today. And thank you also to our audience for uh, their presentations too. So I'd like to uh, now uh, tell you just about our next two webinars. So on the 4th of March, we have a webinar, Learning from, from COVID-19 to Tackle the Silent Pandemic of Antibiotic Resistance. And I hope you will join us with that. And then on the 24th of March, in collaboration with the TB Alliance, we have another uh, webinar on discovering and developing new agents for tuberculosis. So thank you all for joining us. Please do check back for the recording of this webinar and all of our others, and keep up to date with all the other activities done by Guard P and our revived programme. Thank you very much, everybody.